All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm between you and lunch. I'll try to make this quick. Uh, show of hands, who has heard of Rocky Mountain Institute? Okay, pretty good. Good. So for those of you that don't know us, we're a 200-person nonprofit organization. We're headquartered here in Colorado. We have offices in D.C., New York, and Beijing with outposts around the world other than that. Uh, in the U.S. electricity context, we work with utilities, regulators, developers, and government agencies on planning well for the electricity uh, and energy transition. Um, I want to talk about four things today. So you can read this slide and then peace out if you want. Um, the grid is getting old, and one way or another, we're going to have to put down about a trillion dollars through 2030 in CapEx to keep it up. So there's a big avoided cost opportunity. Uh, the economics of the resources that we might invest in with that trillion dollars are different even than they were last year, and they'll be very different next year and five years from now. Utilities and other incumbents uh, can either embrace those trends and ride the wave, if you will, or risk those economic trends getting ahead of them and fragmenting the grid and losing customer load as a result. I want to wrap up with some thoughts about where the industry can go in terms of regulatory policies, market rules, and business models to help ride the wave. So I'm going to break this talk up into four sections on each of those topics, start with the context of the aging grid. I wanted to say before I start, though, this is the first conference I've been to in the last few years where I haven't seen an average of one or greater duck curves per presentation, and I'm really grateful. So thank you, and I promise I will not show you a duck curve. Okay, so the grid is getting old. If you look at all of the thermal generating capacity, so nuclear, coal, and gas fired capacity in the United States, and you sort it by when it was built, and then you look at when those units have retired in the recent past, you find that by 2030, again, if you assume that things are going to retire about when similar units have retired in the past decade, we're going to lose half of the thermal generating capacity to just age-based retirements. And some of those will be slower, some of those will be faster, as we're seeing even today. Uh, to replace all of that retiring generation will cost about half a trillion dollars. So this chart here shows undiscounted capital spending requirements to reinvest in generation down here, uh, continue current transmission and distribution infrastructure investment trends, and we're also taking an average across different forecast sources here. So all told, about half a trillion in generation, and a little bit more than that probably in transmission and distribution. So again, a pretty big avoided cost opportunity for us to ponder as we think about what resources we want the grid to, or we want to invest in uh, over the next few years. So what do those new opportunities look like? I think we've heard a lot of things already even today on batteries and gas and DSM. And I want to share with you guys uh, RMI's perspectives on some of the characteristics of these resource choices we have. So the first, as we all know, uh, renewables are getting really cheap. So these are, the, uh, on the left, we have the levelized cost of wind energy uh, from 1985 to, two, with dated out to 2014. And then the same on the right for solar. Uh, these are logarithmic scales. So the straight line is, is basically an exponential learning rate that each of these kinds of resources are getting cheaper as a function of how much you install. So every doubling of wind capacity worldwide leads to a 19% reduction in cost. Every doubling of solar capacity worldwide leads to a 25% give or take percent reduction in cost. And that trend actually appears to be increasing if you look at recent 2017 data. So what does that mean in the US? So we've seen this year uh, a PPA announced for $12 a megawatt hour in Oklahoma. That's the Invenergy and AEP deal for two gigawatts of wind scale, uh, utility scale wind generation, excluding transmission and including $14 of levelized production, task, uh, production tax credit. But still, $12 subsidized, 26 unsubsidized wind. That is cheaper than running many coal plants, let alone gas plants in the United States. Uh, solar is not quite there yet, but still we're seeing less than $30 bids uh, in the southwest and actually increasingly in the southeast where land is much cheaper. So uh, these trends are 
you know, well on their way and are likely to continue over the next few years, meaning these resources will get cheaper and cheaper. Uh, it's not just renewables. Battery energy storage is getting much cheaper. We've seen versions of this graph already today. Um, so RMI published an analysis in 2015 where we did kind of a meta study of all of the battery price forecasts that we've seen across the industry. So I'm not going to go through the details of the lines or the dots here, but uh, suffice it to say that everyone thinks that batteries are about to get really cheap, and we made this chart in 2015. And then a month later, Tesla introduced something called the Powerwall and moved our price forecast up by seven years. And over the last two years, uh, that trend has continued to accelerate, meaning we're still ahead of the curve, given where we thought we would be even two years ago on battery prices. Uh, it's not just RMI that's taking note. These are just some examples of battery energy storage projects that utilities have undertaken in the last year. So Tucson Electric, uh, 45, megawatt, $45 a megawatt hour inclusive of solar and storage. Duke Energy just announced a new natural gas uh, power plant uh, being avoided uh, in Asheville and Buncombe County uh, with a battery project. Uh, South Australia, I'm sure many of you have heard of Elon Musk's 100 megawatts of batteries in 100 days or your money back. Uh, this, is, this kind of project is just getting more cost effective. But batteries aren't the only way to store energy. We heard uh, uh, Jane talk about the role of DSM. So uh, folks are starting to realize increasingly that you, know, you can store energy in the walls of your house by controlling thermostat timing. You can automatically control when laundry runs. Uh, that's a little bit more of a, a stretch. Water heaters, those are eight kilowatt hour batteries that we each have in our basement, and they cost about 100 bucks to make them grid interactive and actually able to talk and then behave like a battery to the grid in aggregation. And then, of course, EVs, which we've already heard about. So many companies are already looking to use these other batteries uh, at much lower capital cost, utilizing assets that are already in the ground to do basically the exact same thing as batteries. And some examples are here. There are probably dozens more that I haven't heard of. So what does that mean? What does that mean to customers? It means that a customer used to be able to just buy it, right? They used to be able to just pay their monthly bill, take the energy that was delivered, end of, end of story. But now customers can make it, save it, or shift it, right? They can install rooftop solar. They can uh, invest m <coughs> excuse me, even more cost effectively in many energy efficiency technologies. And then with batteries or demand flexibility technologies, they can start to shift it. So they have more choices. They are now more active participants in the grid of the future. So what does this look like in practice? Um, so here, so this isn't a duck curve, but bear with me, bear with me. So this is RMI's own modeling of what a customer in Hawaii could do to take advantage of Hawaii's self-supply tariff. So HECO, the, the utility, basically said, solar PV customers, you are no longer able to just net meter your energy back to the grid. You've either got to use it, or we're going to give you a lot less money for it. So we modeled the economics of a customer actually trying to use as much of their PV as possible. So I'm showing you two scenarios here. The top one is a one-day snapshot of a customer's energy use, which are the, the stacked colors here. And then overlaid with that is the PV production profile, the yellow line. So in this scenario, the customer, as you can see from this one-day snapshot, but also extrapolated over the whole year, is exporting about 50% of their energy back to the grid, and under this new tariff from HECO, basically not getting any money for it, or they would have to curtail it. So what we did was we modeled the costs and the capabilities of EV charging, scheduled EV charging, uh, scheduled dryer operation, scheduled water heater operation, and then pre-cooling and uh, slight temperature drifts in AC set points to basically push all of that load into the PV production envelope and um, make it so that on an annual basis, instead of exporting 50% of your PV energy back to the grid and getting no money for it, you're using 90% of it on site. You're only exporting 10% of it. So the customer here is now the building block of the grid. The customer is their own power plant and self-balancing 90% of the time. That is a fundamental shift and it's cost effective. A year after we published this paper, Tesla introduced this exact same portfolio of products in Hawaii and started offering it commercially to customers. I didn't get a cut, unfortunately. I, 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 I owe them a call. So, this, so DERs, distributed energy resources, can do a lot for customers. They can, it can save them money. 
they can also serve the grid. So um, there will be a test on this, by the way, at lunch. So pay close attention to every single line. But basically, what we're looking at is all of the reliability requirements that the grid has, going from volt var optimization, sort circuit contribution, ranges of frequency support, all the way down to black start. These are the rows of the table. The, the columns of the table are what kinds of generators or other resources are out there that can provide these services. So we all know that coal plants, gas plants, nuclear plants, hydro facilities, they're pretty good at providing all of these services that the grid needs. That's why the grid works today. Awesome. Uh, so the, the balls down here represent kind of how full that Harvey ball is, is how well that, uh, that kind of resource provides that kind of service. And then over on the right, we have all of the new stuff coming online. So synchronous condensers, central renewables, distributed renewables, and then demand response. Um, we've highlighted these uh, sort of more emerging resources on the right where they can provide uh, at least most of the services required uh, as dictated by the grid requirements, right? So everywhere where there's a blue square here means that this emerging resource can actually provide that required service. And this is not RMI saying this, this is EPRI saying this, and this has been validated in many studies uh, that technology companies have run on the grid at pilot scale, working with NREL and others. So basically all of the resource, all the services that we need to run the grid no longer have to come from uh, traditional uh, power plants. So those are the new opportunities. So what does this mean? What does this mean for incumbents? What does this mean for the disruptors in the room? Well, one thing it means is that because solar and batteries are getting so cheap, there is a very real possibility that customers could not, well, maybe not pull the plug from the utility, but at least start self-supplying a vast majority of their energy. So RMI wrote two papers, one in 2014 and one in 2015. I'm showing you results from the second paper that we wrote in 2015 called The Economics of Load Defection. And what I mean when I say load defection is a customer installing PV on their roof, and if they don't have met net metering, installing a battery to capture some of that, and basically self-supplying as much of the energy as possible while still maintaining a connection to the grid. So we looked at the, the, the economics of doing this across five geographies of the United States. So New York, Kentucky, Texas, California, and Hawaii. And what we found is that already in 2014 and definitely in 2017, most parts of the country, it's actually cost effective to put PV on your roof given the retail rates. In some, in some areas that's not true, but it will be soon. Uh, where it starts to get interesting is as net metering becomes less and less common across the United States, it's going to be more and more attractive to back that up with a battery to start capturing and self-supplying your own energy. Uh, and that eventually that becomes the default choice for every geography we looked at by 2050. 2050 is a long way away, but it's within the asset lifetimes of some of the investments going in today. So it, it, it matters because anything you put in the ground not accounting for this trend stands the risk of becoming a stranded asset. So what is that? So, so, so this is the, the customer economics of it, right? So we move from where my, my cheapest option is the grid to where my cheapest option is, is PV and battery plus the grid. What does that do to utility revenues? So I'm showing you two graphs here, one from California, where it's going to happen faster, and one from Texas, where it's going to be a little slower. So the Texas example, I'll, I'll talk through. So we looked at the utility tariff in Texas, and we looked at what portion of customers are going to be able to um, basically uh, install PVs and batteries at a cost savings, and how much of their load they're going to be able to take off the grid and stop paying the utility for. And it starts off slow, it starts off slow, but in the 2020s it ramps up, and again by 2050, 70%. In California, it's already happening. And it's going to accelerate much faster, just given the tariffs in California and the better solar resource in many parts of California. So this is, this is real. It's already happening. Um, and failing to account for this is, is a risk. Uh, so I've given this presentation a couple times. And um, I think that there, there's, there's some doubt that this is real. But I'm not the only person thinking this is real. The finance industry is also very concerned about this. So after we published our first report, these four and other uh, analysts 
uh, started looking very hard at what the future of utility revenues were. And you know, in the case of Barclays, downgraded the entire sector because they saw a significant existential risk to utility revenues. Um, so you can read the quotes. I, I don't need to read them for you. Basically, the, the point is that the finance industry is looking at this and saying, yeah, there's going to be an alternative, and folks could start to leave. And that means that these stocks are worth less. So we've talked about, I, I like to show this graph because I think of we're at a fork in the road in the industry right now. What I've been talking about is the potential for grid defection, for customers to have a cheaper option on site, pull the plug or at least pull most of their load out of the utility revenue base. Well, what if we could do it smarter? And that's what I want to spend the rest of the conversation on today. What if instead of basically planning for two systems in parallel, planning for how customers can help serve their needs at least cost, and then planning to build the grid out with that trillion dollars of CapEx that I talked about without recognizing the potential of resources on the customer side. That's this, that's this top path. What if we could take advantage of both of those and actually use those resources as grid infrastructure? So what we've started to do at RMI and are working with a few partners in the industry to do is look at how you can actually start to think of uh, portfolios of these new resources as virtual power plants, non-wire solutions, basically grid infrastructure that doesn't really look like traditional giant piles of steel in the ground. Um, so this is the preliminary results of some analysis we've done where we looked at a planned gas plant in the western United States. We looked at how much energy that gas plant provides on a yearly basis, how much peak capacity it would provide at the system peak need, and then how much ramp or flexibility requirement we would need to see out of that gas plant in order to meet the needs of the system. And then we ran an optimization that said, well, I know that solar PV and wind are really cheap energy sources, and efficiency is even cheaper, so we can get a lot of our energy from these alternate resources. We can get a lot of our capacity from those same resources and some demand response or demand flexibility. And then the ramp and the flexibility can come mostly from storage. We can mitigate the need with efficiency. Uh, by the way, solar is below the axis here, because solar just makes the duct curve worse. But I didn't show you the duct chart just to be clear. Uh, so anyways, the, the point is that we looked at a bunch of these cases across the United States with planned power plants, or alternately accelerated retirements, and we found that in most cases you can actually do the exact same things that the power plant could do without needing to build a power plant. Uh, it's not just us saying this. Again, this is a map of where utilities are starting to think about this opportunity at scale. So I've, I've called these in my little legend here, pilots or demos that illustrate distributed energy resources or utility scale renewables as a replacement for traditional infrastructure. It's, it's un, uncharitable of me to call some of these pilots. Some of these are on the scale of hundreds of megawatts. So for example, the preferred resources pilot in SoCal Edison, the replacement of Diablo Canyon with DERs and utility scale renewables, what Con Ed is doing up in New York with its non-wire solutions program. This is already happening. Uh, it's happening because it's cheaper in a lot of cases. Uh, so this is the exact same case study I was referring to earlier. We, we looked at a, a natural gas fired power plant in the western US. And we stacked up the, the capex of it here and the opex, the net present value of burning gas to run the plant. And then we did the same thing for the stack of other resources that we could provide those same services with. So higher capex, much lower opex. But on net, net present cost 10 to 15% cheaper. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, utilities are starting to take notice of this. So Duke Energy pulled the plug on a peaker plant in North Carolina. The CPUC rejected the proposal to refurbish the Elwood plant for another 50 megawatts. And then Kaiso just last week suggested a new RFO to settle the debate on whether these resources could actually be cheaper, as battery companies have been saying, for the Puente gas-fired power plant, or whether energy should be allowed to build a new power plant there. So again. We, we think in a lot of cases it's cheaper, and the market is bearing that out even at 2017 prices, let alone 2020 prices. Uh, so what if we built these plants anyways, right? Like what if we actually put all this $500 billion of new gas-fired power plant in the ground? Well, I contend that just as incumbent baseload plants are being outcompeted by the cheap price of natural gas today, so new gas power plants would be outcompeted in the very near future by renewables and DERs. So, 
you know, First Energy, uh, bank, you know, they want to, uh, they want state support to prop up their nuclear plants. Even a new gas-fired power plant in Texas went bankrupt earlier this year. Uh, and no matter what the DOE seems to think uh, around what baseload plants need in this day and age, I think that the, the point is that the cost trends, you know, today of natural gas and tomorrow of renewables and DERs are just going to be the economic choice going forward. So this is a lot of, this is, this is a lot of uh, bar chart. I apologize for that. I'm probably going to go through this pretty quickly. But again, building on some analysis we've been doing at RMI, we think that reinvesting in the grid, and I'm just looking at generation here, not looking at T&D, we think that reinvesting in the grid is going to cost about $500 billion of CapEx in new generation assets. If you, if you NPV that out to 2030 and you also include the run costs, so burning gas to run those plants, that's this stack here, $700 billion net present cost. So we could reduce that by about $370 billion, uh, by the way, saving 4 billion tons of CO2. Um, we could take that money and add a net cost savings invested instead in renewable and utility scale renewables and then DERs, so batteries, new energy efficiency program, expanded demand response. I'm happy to, at the break, walk through the details of this analysis, but the point is we can do this at a net cost savings and that this opens up a new market to the tune of about $350 billion for these non-traditional resources to actually compete against traditional forms of grid infrastructure across the country. <sighs> okay, I'm gonna close with some recommendations and a final thought. So what does this mean for folks? I think on the regulatory side and the market operator side, there's a need to test and actually prove out the ability of DERs to provide these services and then adapt market rules to do so, to, to make that happen. For utilities, again, test and experiment. You hold the keys to making sure that you don't get defected. So why don't you start rolling out these pilots as soon as possible and understanding what your customers want and where the cost savings opportunities lie. And don't plan to just replace one-to-one -one the new assets. Plan, plan for the long term. Um, and then finally, I, I still see the need for DER developers to integrate across assets. So you know, not just batteries necessarily, but batteries plus demand response and then continue to drive down costs because we're not quite there yet for much of the country. So this is my last slide. Um, what happens if you don't change? What happens if the, we, we put a trillion dollars of capital under the grid without recognizing these fundamental uh, opportunities? So this is a picture from 1900, Fifth Avenue, New York City, Easter Parade. I'm told that there is a car. One of the first cars in New York City is in this picture. I can't find it. It's a really bad picture. Um, 13 years later, same picture, same parade. I think there's one horse in this picture. What, what happened in the intervening years? Henry Ford invented the Model T, rolled it out at scale in uh, automated manufacturing facilities. <clears throat> so that is kind of a, a corollary to what we're seeing today. The solution, or I guess the replacement for traditional infrastructure assets are being produced at hundreds of gigawatts of scale in factories around the world. Those costs are continuing to come down. And 13 years from now, I believe, we could be in a very different spot. And we could have a picture like this contrasted to a picture like that. Thank you very much. I'm holding you from lunch. Are there questions that are burning? Oh, come on. You have to disagree with something I said. Gary. So Mark, uh, obviously, uh, from your perspective, uh, you took a long view of Trump. Uh, who's affected on the uh, resulting in the drive to keep it uh, in the long style that we have in place today? But do you see this coming to the next few years, or are you just all holding it? Yeah, um, so a couple thoughts. I, I think in Texas, for example, uh, T&D rates, the T&D portion of retail tariffs has 
increase and some are forecasting to keep increasing at between five and nine percent annually each year. So that is going to keep driving rates up even as we see the price of natural gas and the low cost of renewables keeping the energy portion of rates down. So we, we're, we're still very confident in the rising rate uh, trajection, uh, trajectories, projections that we have in our paper. Um, and yeah, I think that you know, we've seen battery costs and solar costs come down even faster than we expected a few years ago. So the economics are looking even better. The question is whether, our, whether companies are ready to um, you know, take the plunge. So Solar City's already done it in, in Hawaii. I, I don't necessarily see it in the next couple years in, in the mainland, but in these areas where, you know, like in Texas, the T&D rates are skyrocketing, California, where there are already high rates, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Um, and so in our work with regulators, I think we want to make sure that they are getting ahead of this and not kind of digging their heels in on the opportunity. So the Hawaii example is interesting, right? It, it, it's a recognition by the regulator that there's a value to having the building block of the grid be a little bit smaller than it has been in the past, kind of at the customer site. And so I, we could argue about whether that's the best regulatory policy to, to engage there, but um, I, I agree with your point that the incentives that folks set up today are going to drive where the market goes over the next few years. Yeah. Yep. So, so this chart actually is just for those customers that would be eligible. Okay. We have other versions of this chart in the paper that I pulled this from that do exactly what you're describing and look at it across the utility territory and, and derate that number based on who would be eligible for solar. So I, I totally agree. This is solar eligible. Yeah, exactly. No, there's no reason to put storage on your house if you have net metering from an economic perspective, uh, that, unless you want backup power. But this, this is explicitly assuming no net metering for these customers, which is not what we see today, but it is a trend that is increasing in many parts of the country. Dave, do you have a question? It would delay it by a few years. It's already, I mean, the ITC is already sunsetting in early 2020s. So the projections that we're using take that into account. Um, so I think the specific chart we're looking at, if you updated this for 2017 pricing and trajectories, we would actually see more defection. And if you eliminated the ITC early, or if the, uh, the trade case goes the wrong way for cheap solar in the United States, it would, it would push it back, but it's not going to stop it. Yeah. 
100% agree. That's, that's why we show this chart, to start that conversation with how can the utility adapt, and it comes from rate basing the assets and helping their customers install them themselves, uh, it, many other options. Uh, so that's, that's the big opportunity here for, for the incumbents in the industry to stay ahead of the issue. I agree, yeah, because otherwise you're just going to have solar that cuts itself off when there's a voltage tag and makes the problem worse, like they, they had in Germany before they readjusted the rules, so 100% agree. Cool, well, I don't want to keep anyone hungry any longer. Thanks again. Thank you.